Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. <laughs> the good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. <laughs> Astro seismology, magnetism, the dark side, genetically engineered potatoes, planetoid, planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we inject weird and wonderful science directly into your genes. I'm Ian Wolfe. On this edition, Ben Eggleton explains the science behind the internet. But first up, Here's news about radioactive diamonds. Nuclear diamond batteries. A team of physicists and chemists from the University of Bristol have grown a synthetic diamond shell that can generate power from a radioactive source that emits beta radiation. Beta radiation is in the form of energetic electrons. It's the form of radioactivity that's most easily stopped by shielding. The team propose to create a nuclear battery using carbon-14 extracted from nuclear waste and turning it into a radioactive diamond that can sit inside their non-radioactive synthetic diamond shell. Carbon-14 is the element also used in radiocarbon dating. Their prototype nuclear diamond battery uses nickel-63 as its radioactive source instead of the proposed carbon-14 from nuclear waste. I'm guessing that's because it's cheaper to demonstrate and develop. They can generate 15 joules of energy per day per gram with this nuclear diamond battery, which is an energy density of 170 microwatts per gram delivering around 2 volts. In the UK, most nuclear power stations use a graphite core to moderate the neutrons in nuclear reactions, making sure the reaction stays under control. When the nuclear power stations are decommissioned, radioactive carbon is found in a shell around the outside of the spent fuel rods, where it offers some radioactive shielding. The team proposed that they could heat the fuel rods to evaporate the carbon-14 and then condense the gaseous carbon-14 into synthetic diamonds. This radioactive carbon-14 diamond would sit inside a shell of stable carbon-12 synthetic diamond. They don't say what kinds of radioactive gases are released in the process, but presumably the remainder of the fuel rods would be returned to where they were kept, maybe at Sellafield. Some writers have suggested that the diamonds will be used to safely contain and shield all of the spent nuclear fuel rods while generating power, as the plutonium in the nuclear waste decays to safety over the next 240,000 years. But this is not the case. Only the carbon on the outside of the fuel rods will be used in the nuclear diamond batteries. This is not a solution for storing most nuclear waste. Carbon-14 undergoes beta decay, where electrons are emitted. These electrons are absorbed by other carbon-14 atoms, and through ionisation, release electrons that can be conducted out through metal electrodes at the end of the diamond. The shell of carbon-12 diamond will also absorb the beta radiation electrons, which will kick out further electrons that can also be conducted away from the diamond by metal electrodes. This generates about 170 microwatts per gram of diamond, which means you would need nearly 60 kilograms of nuclear diamond battery to power a 10 watt power saver light bulb, or about 30 kilograms to power a smartphone. If a single LED uses, say, 33 milliwatts, then a 190 gram diamond battery could power it, compared to 15 grams for a AA battery. However, The AA battery will last only 24 hours of continuous use, while the diamond battery might keep powering for a few thousand years. However, the carbon-14 decays into nitrogen-14, which means nitrogen gas will build up in the diamond shell and eventually crack it open, breaking the battery and whatever it's powering. Industrial diamond costs about $1,000 per gram to manufacture. But I'm sure a process involving radioactive waste and forming nested synthetic diamond shells will cost much more than that. 
Other beta radiation based electrical generators known as beta voltaic cells have been previously on the market, commonly using tritium, a radioactive source of hydrogen as the source. Tritium is sometimes used to make things glow in the dark safely by stopping the beta radiation with a fluorescent layer that glows as it blocks the radiation. Pacemakers used to be beta voltaic cells, using radioactive promethium as the source. But they needed to be replaced after two and a half years, and they were considered dangerous because they also emitted gamma radiation. So they were replaced with lithium batteries. The researchers suggest that the nuclear diamond batteries would be most useful in places where you can't replace batteries, and you need the power to last, such as pacemakers, satellites, spacecraft, and surveillance drones. It doesn't seem practical to launch such a heavy battery into space or even in the air when lighter alternatives are available. This appears to be one of the most expensive kinds of power to generate, but it has the advantage of providing continuous power for a very long time. The half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years, so it will take that long to lose 50% of its power. Bristol University's Professor Tom Scott announced the nuclear diamond battery at the Cabot Institute Annual Lecture in 2016, Ideas to Change the World, and the university sent out a press release, but his team hasn't published a paper. This is a shame because the press release and accompanying video are badly written and would lead you to misunderstand what's been achieved and what's proposed. It's not a diamond that is brought near a radioactive field to generate power. It's a diamond shell with a radioactive diamond inside it. The UK does hold almost 95,000 tonnes of graphite blocks of radioactive waste, but it's all firmly attached to highly radioactive spent fuel rods and will need to be boiled off to make their radioactive synthetic diamond sources. This is not recycling or safely storing the spent fuel rods. It's taking away the outer shell of radioactive carbon with extreme heat, and then putting the rest of the fuel rods back. A diamond within a diamond that provides 2 volts at a tenth of a milliwatt per gram of continuous power for thousands of years must have a practical use. However hard it is to think of one. The University of Bristol is asking you to tweet your suggestions using the hashtag DiamondBattery. Thus far, the best suggestion I've seen tweeted was to power electronic media in time capsules. I wonder if the decay of carbon into nitrogen will make the batteries crack or go bang. These diamonds are not forever. You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. And next, the science behind the internet. Ben Eggleton is an Australian Research Council Laureate Fellow and Professor of Physics at the University of Sydney. Director of the Australian Research Council Centre for Ultra High Bandwidth Devices for Optical Systems, QDOS, and Director of the Institute of Photonics and Optical Science, IPOS, at the University of Sydney. I began by asking him where do people start to understand the physics of the internet? To understand the contemporary communications network, the backbone of the internet, if you like, you have to go right down to the basics and understand that the backbone of that network is based around lasers and optical fibres. So a laser is a a source of light, it was invented in the 60s, and it's a source of coherent monochromatic light. So it produces very intense light and essentially the the basic idea that everyone's going to relate to is that laser communications is a little bit like Morse code. You're sending bits of information. So you have to imagine someone standing on one side of the park with a torch and they're putting their hand in front of the torch to create a one or a zero and they're communicating through this digital binary format and that's sort of the basis of all communications uh, 
information uh, transmission around the world. Of course, the key to the current approach to communications is that lasers and optical fibres offers really amazing bandwidths. And by bandwidths, I mean the amounts of information, the data capacity. And just to be very concrete, if we go back 20 years, connectivity was based on copper and there was some optical fibre deployed. But typically we talked around uh, hundreds of megabits per second. And of course, we're all familiar at home. If we're lucky, we're probably getting megabits at per second at home. I live in Camperdown and I struggle to get a megabit per second. Let me not got bogged down on that and let's not get into a conversation about the National Broadband Network. But just to give you a factoid, the record right now in terms of information capacity in an optical fibre is about five petabits per second. So let's get our head around that. A megabit is a million bits per second. A gigabit is a billion bits per second, a terabit is a million million. Okay, so that's 10 to the 12. A petabit is a thousand terabits. So that's 10 to the 15 bits per second through a single optical fiber, an optical fiber of the size of the human hair. So a petabit then corresponds to thousands and thousands of DVDs per second. So optical fibers have this really amazing capacity to transmit data at essentially the speed of light. Well, essentially it's about half the speed of light or two thirds of the speed of light. And that's obviously the breakthrough, the big step change that enabled this global connectivity that took place about uh, 20 to 30 years ago with the rollout of optical fiber. So lasers allow you to encode vast amounts of data onto these optical fibers. The optical fibers are essentially light pipes. You just think of them as a light pipe, a very, very thin light pipe, the size of a a fishing wire and they have this um, amazing capacity for bandwidth to be transmitted and that's the backbone of the network. So I like to use the analogy of the highway systems. We have uh, highway systems that connect uh, the world under the oceans, between the major cities, within the cities, within the suburbs and we'd like to imagine, we'd like to have these optical fibres connect to our homes but they don't. We often rely on copper for that last 100 metres or 20 metres, but essentially that optical fibre provides all that connectivity and all that bandwidth. And you won't have that bandwidth with copper. It simply doesn't have the bandwidth to transmit that amount of information. So I know that they've tried to upgrade what you can do with copper and they've got some higher speeds. And of course, they've done the same with fibres. So if you have fibre already laid and someone invents a way to go faster, do you have to relay the fibre? Or can you just change the receiver and sender? So the beautiful thing about optical fibre is that it really is future-proof. That glass itself is a, a light pipe that has potentially terabits of bandwidth. Okay, so fundamentally from the basic physics, that piece of glass is very transparent. It's very low loss. You can send data over tens of kilometres without requiring amplification. So it's more than compatible with deploying optical fibres within a suburb to the home. And once you've deployed that fibre, once you've connected up that house, that fibre will survive 50 years. It's not going to be, it's not going to degrade. Of course, the laser and the receiver needs to be compatible with the type of data traffic that you're imagining and the higher speeds you're going to want to operate at, you might need to upgrade the transmitter and the receiver, but I'm pretty confident that those components are pretty low cost. So I think on day one, you're going to deploy those connections with low cost components and you're going to have a link that is going to be Uh, future-proof for generations. And I think that's the whole point of investing in in optical fibre. It's not going to degrade. It has a potential bandwidth capacity of tens of terabits per second. Now, the average home is going to be very happy with gigabits per second. Most homes in Sydney are probably around 10 to 100 megabits per second. So there are a 1,000 megabits and a gigabits and there are a thousand gigabits and a terabit so again that future proof that scaling will keep satisfied for many generations whereas they're getting gigabit out of copper these days well look 
In terms of the leading edge copper gigabit sounds pretty remarkable. I know that they've made progress with copper and they are getting more bandwidth. The problem with copper is that you can't send that very far and you have to jump through some hoops to get up to those high speeds and then you are fundamentally going to be clamped at that bandwidth. So I mean I don't want to get into a debate between copper and optical fiber. It's an old conversation. The point is very simply that optical fibers can go way beyond gigabit per second. Australia is losing the race. We are going down the rankings in terms of bandwidth. I live in Camperdown. I'm getting less bandwidth in my home than I was getting 10 years ago. I'm not on the NBN. The NBN is on the other side of Parramatta Road. But I'm now getting less bandwidth. I can't download manuscripts when I sit there and have my coffee in the morning. So. I just shake my head and it is just a very bad situation. The rest of the world, Singapore, Korea, of course, China is leaping forward, um, massive investment in optical fiber technology, embracing photonics and optical fiber because they know it's the future. They know it's future proof, it's scalable. It can be low cost and it can provide the bandwidth that we need as a society. We want to smart society and innovation economy we want to live in smart cities smart grids we need global connectivity it's going to drive innovation we're moving into a very exciting phase with global connectivity in terms of ai vr machine to machine communications i mean it's all happening and it's all around connectivity and 5g is going to transform the way communication systems are delivered and the services that they can provide and isn't 5G also photons? Isn't radio also photons? Yes, of course. The interesting thing is microwaves, radio also deals with electromagnetic waves. They're just a different part of the spectrum. So when we think about 5G, we're typically talking about electromagnetic waves that have a frequency of 50 gigahertz. When we talk about optical frequencies, we're talking about hundreds of terahertz. And of course, that is the fundamental difference between microwave and optical, that the optical frequencies are so much higher that we can encode on those frequencies much more data traffic. Okay, so fundamentally the advantage of operating in the optical domain is that we have this enormous bandwidth. Now, operating in 5G when the carrier frequency might be 50 gigahertz, you have tens of gigabits per second. Well, relative to tens of petabits per second. So there are you know, many orders of magnitude. But of course, global connectivity relies on a combination of the optical for the backbone, providing that uh, pipe into your home. But of course, in terms of mobility and all of the, the smart functions that are going to exist in our smart cities and smart grids and smart homes, wireless connectivity is a central part of that whole ecosystem. And of course, the interface between wireless and optical is, is very important. And those two technologies are being developed in parallel and there are many common challenges in terms of the cost and the energy consumption and the latency issues around how we build a network that allows for all these very smart functions to exist as we become smarter and smarter in terms of how we use these smart devices. And when we're trying to use radio across distances greater than the nearest tower, how does radio perform? Yeah, so of course the, the fundamental issue with the microwaves is that it doesn't have the range that optical has. Uh, so optical fibres we can deploy over thousands of kilometres. You can send light through an optical fibre by around 80 to 100 kilometres before you need to amplify it. But with wireless communications you're typically you know, talking about um, cell phone towers that are distributed through a built environment and you're needing to have that sort of proximity and that low bandwidth. So they go hand in hand. Having said that, there are certainly many examples of wireless connections that are long distance. To give you a couple of examples, we deal with companies that develop wireless communication systems for banks. They're very interested in utilizing wireless, what's called wireless backhaul or 5G backhaul, if you like, for connecting banks that might be in Chicago to New York, it might be New York to New Jersey. One of the fundamental advantages of wireless is in fact that because they're transmitting these electromagnetic waves through air, uh, the speed of the information is actually faster than the speed of the light through an optical fibre by about 35%. Because when you send through light light through an optical fibre, it's been slowed down by about 35% because of 
the refractive index of the medium. And so using free space, you get that inherent advantage. So in terms of latency, which banks are very interested in, that makes a big difference. So if it's an additional millisecond because you're going across the Atlantic through slow optical fibres or going through a hollow fibre that has a much faster speed of light, you have an inherent advantage relative to your competition. So latency is to do with how slow the signal is and banks want to trade more quickly yeah, than so everybody else? That's right. So my kids refer to lag when they're gaming. Latency is essentially this lag somewhere in the network and that lag, that latency we all deal with can be a real pain if you're, for example, dealing with virtual reality. You might talk or think about remote medicine, healthcare, you might think about machine-to-machine -machine communications and you might think about banks trading where these are in fact computers communicating with computers machines to machines that are communicating and they're making decisions and they're making deals in real time and in that case latency becomes very important and banks are prepared to put a lot of money into developing very low latency communications links because they can't afford the five ten milliseconds you know it costs a few tens of milliseconds to get across the atlantic and so if you can shave off five milliseconds, then you have the inherent advantage, and that's going to translate into dollars and cents. So that's where latency matters. And it's becoming more important as we deploy you know, smart devices through our uh, community and we rely on computers and machines to communicate with machines. And you know, the concept of remote medicine operating on someone on the other side of the planet you know, you don't want to have a three-second latency. You don't really want to have a 100-millisecond latency. You don't even want a 10-millisecond latency if you can afford it. So for most people in Australia, 5G would be part of a national network as opposed to an alternative though? Yes, yeah, so 5G is part of the network. It's, it's not, as I said, it's not competition between the optical physical layer and the 5G. They go hand in hand. 5G is about providing more bandwidth to users, smaller cells, more directivity, selectivity to individuals driving more applications and of course that increased burden on the backbone of the network is going to push the physical layer to be compatible with that increased bandwidth capacity and latency reduction and energy consumption. So they're going hand in hand and you know the conversation it should be a, a, a one conversation about the network which has the wireless it should have the optical going hand in hand and what's interesting at the moment in my group is that as a group that has historically been working in optical physics and photonics, we are now applying photonics to wireless communication. So we're developing next generation wireless and microwave devices, harnessing photonics to increase the bandwidth and reconfigurability of these devices. So we're using some very interesting physics to actually bridge optical and microwaves. And so there's an interesting convergence, you know, that optical Science underpins the backbone of the optical fibre network, but at the same time, optical science is underpinning next generation wireless communications technologies. So I think that, you know, it's a very exciting time to be living with the internet that we rely on every day, but we're moving into the next phase, which I think is going to be much more sophisticated in terms of the value that this global connectivity is going to provide to uh, users, to a community. So we're talking about smart cities and smart grids and smart devices, smart sensors, ubiquitous bandwidth, low latency communication systems. Um, we're going to start to see you know, remote surgery. 5G is going to provide more bandwidth to users. And of course, one of the overarching issues around all of these areas is cyber security we need increased awareness around cyber security but it's an exciting time and i think for the next 10 years uh, we'd like to think that in australia our communications infrastructure is starting to really increase our productivity and drive the economy forward and increase across all sectors of society ben eagleton thank you very much thank you nice to talk to you that was Professor Ben Eggleton explaining the physics of our modern communications networks. Ben will be back next week to report on his latest research. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. My apologies for the mix-up with the Head Transplant Special Edition. A lot of people didn't get to download it. If you can check your podcast catcher and see if it turned up, you may get to hear it that way. Would you like to hear your voice on radio? 
record a voice memo on your phone, or use the voicemail tab on the website. We need more people contributing stories to Diffusion. Send your contributions, opinions, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. And please do send me an email so I know you're listening and you'd like to hear more episodes. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate us on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. Join my patrons in supporting the show at patreon.com slash diffusionradio. The news music was Rhinos Theme by Kevin MacLeod of Incompetech.com. Checking production was Charles Willock. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia to 27 stations on the community radio network, including 2 RBM in the Blue Mountains of New South Wales, 8 Triple C in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2 MVR in Nambucca Valley, and 3 MBR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation's Science360 internet radio station, and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to our podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com. And check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed this show, you can explore more than 900 previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel at youtube.com slash c slash Diffusion Radio. I'm Ian Wolfe. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the Earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick. Everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man. Knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits. Photography. Collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.